Good morning. So when Jesus was on the cross, you know, he, he says many words and many things happen. The, the dead straight up come out of the graves and start walking around. There's, there's some miracles that happen. And one of the ones that I think we miss the extreme nature of is where the veil was torn. And, and so I tried to get a ladder that was, so I could reach 30 feet. So, so I went, you know, I found the goofy little one, but obviously probably like three feet. And then I found this one, which we might want to use later, so I can trade my house. And then I found this one, and I was like, this is pretty tall, right? And, and he goes to 28 feet tall. And then I realized this room isn't big enough to actually put it up. So I sat it up here, and, and I got to thinking about this veil that's, that's 90 foot tall. 90 foot tall, and thick as your hand. This way, not this way. And, and just imagining a man trying to climb to the top of this veil. This 90 foot, foot veil. And I you know, assume this is about 10 feet. It's about 3 foot out. It's about 14 foot tall. So about 10 foot tall. And imagine 9 of them. I want us to get the height of this veil that protected God from just killing us. That protected God from taking us all out. That kept God from destroying everyone. Because it protected us from coming too close to God. And, and, and the issue is, when we look at this from down here, we see only a tenth of how tall this veil was. And this is the same veil that God destroys. And he rips from his end. And, and could you imagine a man trying, and he gets his ladder, and he finally gets a 90 foot tall ladder. I would not even want to go half that height, but he goes up and he climbs it. And you know, every little step of the way, and you have to realize, you know, at, at this level, I'm, I'm pretty sturdy. I mean, I can bounce up and down, jump, and I'm pretty good. I get a little bit higher, and you can here. It, it's starting to wiggle. This is two steps. Let's go three just to be scary. Okay. Can y'all hear it? I'm trying to lean so you can hear the mic. Sorry. This, it's wiggling already. I'm, I'm three steps up. So I'm about three foot high and I'm already starting to wiggle. And then I work and I work and I trust myself enough to go to that 90 foot and I get to the top of this veil. And then the obvious hits me. I'm not worthy to touch that thing. I, I, I overcame my fears. I overcame everything I was facing. I, I, I served God. I, I, I did those steps. And I, I put that law in place and I observed one law after another law after another law. And I got to this top and then realized I wasn't worthy to touch that veil. All that climbing up this 90 foot tall ladder. All, all, all the effort I put into it and then I get to the top and I can't even touch it. Because God has that veil there to protect me. The, the same as with Moses. He came back from talking to the Lord and we were so scared. Because he shone with the glory of the Lord and we were just overcome. We said, can you put something over that so we don't have to look at it? We don't all want to die. We, we don't want God to just wipe us out because we looked on his glory. And so every one of those steps, all that law that we kept, all those efforts, <laughs> and each step being a little bit harder for us, and we know that no man did Tear down that veil. It wasn't torn by a man. When Jesus saw on the cross, that veil did not get torn from bottom to top. It got torn from top to bottom. And a veil that they were not to touch, that we were unworthy to touch, much less try to move. And God takes it and tears it from top to bottom, and He introduces something Himself. 
Where is 2 Corinthians chapter 3? Starting in verse 1, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need as some letters of commendation for you? To you or from you? You are our letter. Written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ. Cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves. But our adequacy is from God. Who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death and letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed, what had glory? In this case, has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. Our story of the latter is, is that of the, the law and that of trying to go step after step and achieve something and then getting to the top and figuring out you're still not making it. <clears throat> the, the whole Messiah point was that we weren't Succeeding. It wasn't that Jesus came because everything was working out. Jesus came because we were failing over and over and over. And it wasn't that we were inadequate then, but we're now we're adequate. It was that we are never adequate. At no point are we able to come to the law and say, let me just get rid of that. Jesus comes and he says, nothing passes from the law. Not one letter. Remember he says, the letter gives death. The letter, not one letter, can pass from that law till all is fulfilled. If you teach to obey one, disobey one commandment of that law, you are to be cursed. This is what Jesus came to. He came because there is this inadequacy that we need to get to. Where we say, God, my working my working and doing this and trying to make everything into a law. It's like if I do all these steps. And God sits there and says, it's not about letter. It's not about my engraved. Imagine the Ten Commandments. They are engraved by the hand of God. The very hand of God touches them and engraves these stones. How glorious is that? And yet he says, that has so little glory that it has no glory in comparison to the glory of this new covenant. Where he doesn't take stones and write his word, but he takes our heart. And he writes his word on our heart and gives us this new covenant. In verse 12, he continues with this idea. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech. And are not like Moses who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened, for until this very day at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains, unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. That's Christianity. 
Christianity works best in contrast. Christianity only works once we've had the law as our school teacher, where we sat there and we did, and we took step by step, and we were saying, God, I can do this, I can do this, I can, oh, okay, I'm getting a little nervous, but I'm still going. It's getting a little shaky, it's getting a little harder, God, I, oh. And at some point, I'm getting there, and I'm like, this wrong doesn't feel good, let's take it down and start over. Let's fix this ladder, and then we'll try again, and we'll try again, and we'll try again. And we will try to take the law and make it, and then we will try to become this righteousness. <clears throat> but we get to the top and realize we failed God too many times. And, and this glory that causes Moses' face to shine, not when it's new, not when it's fresh, but after he has come down from the mountain, it's still shining. And he gives us this letter and he says, I write it on your heart, I give it your spirit. And it's no longer where people see the fading glory of us being with God, but they see the glory of God when we serve God. We become the mouthpieces. We become the face that they get to see because we are the temple. And that glory becomes such a small thing that he says it's nothing anymore. But we, like that law, do. Oh, we love law. We do. We're all about rules and, you know, let, let's do this. And, and God says it's so different than that. It's about your heart. And they ask him, they say, Jesus, what are, you know, what's the greatest commandment? You know, there's enough of them. I'll start with the most important first. Let me start my ladder on the, you know, the really good one. And he takes one that, you know, it, it, it's in the law, but I, I wouldn't have put it in, you know, the top ten list. It, it just, it's, it's more like a guideline than a rule. You know that is, we've got guidelines, you know, technically that's the speed limit. It's a suggested limit, you know. We like guidelines. We're like, they're flexible. And that's more like a guideline when we're looking at it. It's not one of those strict laws that we like. But he teaches us this and he says, love the Lord your God. So what about all the other things? You know, there, there's, a, there's ten commandments, right? And, and I was reading through them looking for certain words like love. Obvious one, right? And you know, you would think if, if I'm going to say two of the most important commandments, there it comes from the ten, right? Because the ten, very hands of God. I mean, very awesome. It comes from Mount Sinai, it comes down, and his face is shining, and he's telling them, and it's beautiful, and Jesus is like, that's not even on that list. I got two of them for you. And he says, love God and love your neighbor. Hmm. Neither one's on the list. And today, we, we would love to make these rules. You know, I, I, I did the steps. I did the things that you wanted me to do. But that's not how he says it. He, we could usually answer Christianity with this. Do you love him? We can define most of Christianity in one question. Do you love him? Now, now the first part of that is, do you love him as do you love God? And, and my question with that is, what are you saying to God that I am not worthy to do? What is it about this ladder that you hate so much that you're like, God, I won't do that for you? And, and I use ladders because we have those who are afraid of heights, and it works best if you're afraid of heights. It does. I get about 20 feet, and I start getting scared. And I like that because it's a good fit. It's that thing, where do we go with God and we say, God, I love you so much, but when you ask this one thing, I'm not going to do it. Well, when you want something from me, when is it that I'm going to say, no, God, I just don't love you that much? And if we looked at our Christianity and we said, when is it that I'm going to tell God that I don't love him that much? It would change how we did everything. It wouldn't be about steps or rules or 
making this process or any of that, it would be, when am I going to say no to God? When am I going to say, God, I, I love you, I just don't love you that much? And, and in our lives, that, that comes in many different places. It, it, it may come as, you know, we, we may, be, may be willing to, you know, submit to Him. Be baptized into Him. But we may be willing to do that. But then when it starts living for Him, it may be, I would be a good Christian, I would be outspoken, except when I'm around this person. I, I don't want this person to feel negatively about me. I, I don't want to risk my job, right? Because we're not supposed to do anything in our job. It's not for God. Oh, it, it may be, you know, I get in my car and I say, God, I don't care. I mean, I'm gonna, right? I'm gonna hate on every other person out there. Do you imagine being in traffic and keep letting people in? How obnoxious that would be. <laughs> So, so you've got an hour long of traffic and you decide I'm going to be a Christian today in traffic. Two hours later you make it home. <laughs> and, and, but, but that works because it's not a law where God says, well here's all the rules. When you're driving, I haven't said anything about that, so it doesn't matter. It's one of those where the law is written on our hearts. And we say, do I love God enough that in the middle of traffic, I'm like, come on in. Add another 15 minutes. Come on. And the advantage to us having this law of liberty is it sets us free from a law of death. So that we live and we try, strive to love God. And when we do, we have to ask Him in every area now. It's no longer I, I went and did this. It's one of those steps. I have to do it. Well, this isn't on that step. I don't have to do it. This is one of those where it's written on our hearts. And the Spirit guides us to love. And love covers every situation. Second Corinthians chapter 5, starting at verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. You made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. They end with that appeal. That God has already torn that veil and he just says, come on in. Submit to him. Be his. So today, that invitation is extended to believe in the work of Christ. That Jesus is Lord. To confess him as Lord. To repent of our sins knowing that when it came to works, we failed. And we want forgiveness for that. And coming to God and submitting to being baptized. Letting Him wash us. Letting Him cleanse us through our submission to Him. So that we then can live for Him and we can be the righteousness of God and one day be reunited with Him. Crossing right past that veil, right to the Holy of Holies, right into the presence of the Lord where we can fall down for Him. If there's anybody who needs that, or anybody who needs prayers, or anybody who wishes to submit to the eldership here, we ask you to come now as we stay and as we sing.